Apple TV Plus is entering the Emmy game this year. Their horse in the limited series race is Spring Entry Defending Jacob. I'm Riley Chow, contributing editor at Gold Derby, here with uh, Mark Bombeck, who wrote all the episodes adapting the story from the novel by Will and Landy. Now, I never like to ask questions that have already been answered, but at this time, uh, there are no interviews online with you about the show. So take us back to the beginning and give us the full origin story of this project. Sure. So, uh, gosh, about three years ago, uh, Anonymous Content had sent me the novel, Depending Jacob, by William Landay. It had just come out of option from Warner Brothers. Steve Clovis had been trying to make it as a film, and it didn't come to fruition. And because I'm primarily a feature writer, they sent it to me with the idea that would I want to adapt it into a film. And I started reading it, and it immediately became clear to me why there was a struggle at Warner Brothers to get it made. It's just not the kind of story that is easily made into a film anymore. But while I was reading it, I kept on thinking this would make an incredible limited series. And I had been sort of on the hunt for something that uh, would do, uh, I don't know, my sort of, um, my North Star is always uh, Mystic River uh, when I think about like elevated genre, like um, something that is the twists and turns of a great thriller, but also uh, really is about what it means to be a human being. And in Bill's book, I was kept on reading it. And I'm like, please, please don't go off the rails. I love the story so much. I hope that it, it, it delivers. And it did. I mean, it's not to say that it was ready made and I could just, you know, transcribe it, but there was so many great ideas going on, uh, not only thriller ideas, but again, just dramatic ideas. Uh, so I called up Anonymous and said, I have not much interest in doing this as a feature, but I have a ton of interest in trying to do this as a limited series. And so we uh, started to figure out how to make that work. Yeah, how did you land on the length of it at eight episodes? Um, it sort of organically fell into an eight episode structure. Uh, I started just to break the story down as to, you know, about how much, uh, I don't know, it, 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 I was sort of, I, I guess what I would say is like I started outlining and when I got to what I thought would be the end of episode one, it became clear to me, okay, uh, this is about as much story as I want to tell in each episode. And as I started going forward, it turned into eight. There was a point when I flirted with it maybe being seven, but everything was getting a little too chock full. And so eight felt natural to me. Um, when Chris Evans first read it, he had only read the pilot and um, I think the second episode when we started talking and he expressed some concern, gee, it's, it's, it's maybe seven feels better than eight. Um, and I said, if that's the case, then we're just going to make it seven. And by the time we were done, uh, when he read all eight, he was like, I actually can't believe it's fitting into eight. It feels like it almost could do nine or ten. So um, eight felt like the right number. Now, television is really a writer's medium. Uh, here you were thrust into the position of executive producer, even though you hadn't been one for television before. So what was it like taking on those show running responsibilities, uh, especially coming into it for the first time? It was a huge education. I mean, that was part of the appeal was um, the different role that a writer has in, in TV versus film. I've been doing features for a long, long time, and I love being a screenwriter. But um, it's no secret that it's at some point in that process, you do see a lot of control to the director, which is how it should be. The director, uh, it, ultimately this gets funneled through a vision in, in, um, in film, that film, that, that vision is the director's. Uh, in TV, uh, it, again, it is more of a writer's medium. So that was one of the appeals. And yet there are a lot of, you know, this is a bit of a cliche, but it's true. There's a lot of different hats you wear when you're a showrunner. So I did figure out how to be a producer in, a, in, in the most practical way in terms of who we're going to hire for different roles, uh, not only behind the scenes, of course, but in front of the camera. And uh, obviously my first task was figuring out who would be the right director for it. And again, in a, in a film situation, it's usually the studio saying to me, we'd like you to meet the director we just brought on. In this case, I actually had, uh, I was the one who was able to say, I think I'd like to bring it to Morton Tildum. And uh, and Morton and I actually created a real partnership because it, he wound up directing all eight. So it started functioning a bit more like a movie, except that we were both very cognizant of the fact that this was this is a limited series. And 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 part of my attraction to it was that we were going to function like like a limited series. And so um, we were good about defining what each other's roles were. 
and Morton's an exec producer on it as well. Uh, and so we did spend a lot of time making decisions together. But again, in a film, uh, this, unless I was the producer of the film, uh, the screenwriter is more deferential to what the director needs and wants. Um, this was much more of a 50-50 uh, partnership, which was great for me. Now, I don't recall you having worked with him before, so uh, why did you envision more than told him, uh, told him being the director for this? It's funny, he had, um, he had made a film called Headhunters, which uh, I loved, and uh, he had just directed the pilot for Jack Ryan, I think, and Paramount were the ones who had said, we just came up, we were just starting to talk about who a director could be. And Paramount said, we just finished working with Morton and Jack Ryan. Are you familiar with his? And so it's so funny, like something about the aesthetic that what went into Headhunters sort of nagged me. And it, Headhunters is definitely uh, a little bit more uh, dark comedy than Defending Jacob is. But there's this sort of Scandinavian um, worldview that it, that it has that I thought would be a, an interesting fit for Defending Jacob. And, uh, and obviously, I was a big fan of his work on the Imitation Game. So uh, we had a conversation, and to bring it back to Mystic River, the very first film that he brought up in our conversation was Mystic River, and said, I feel like this is where you're, what you're going for. Uh, and the minute he said that, I, I realized we sort of were seeing the same thing. And so that's how he came on board. And Morton is incredibly experienced and just a massive asset when you're just figuring out something this big. So this story is kind of a murder mystery, but how important is it that viewers are actually able to figure out kind of who did it? And like, how important uh, are the specifics of the case in that sense? Um, have you watched the whole show by now? I have, yeah, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> uh, I think it's obviously, look, I try to think of it not only as the person who's creating it, but also as someone who would be watching it and what I would want to get out of it. Um, Obviously, it's a whodunit, and you have to sort of honor that. Uh, I think it's a big part of it. But my, what attracted me to it, uh, I have four kids, right? And my central preoccupation is how much I'm screwing them up and to what extent I do or don't know really who they are and to what extent we can know who anybody is who, are in lo you know, who we love. And um, so for me, the story that I was trying to tell was really about the parents' experiences. And so... The who done it is seen through the lens of who do the parents think did it, and the stakes could not possibly be higher when it's your own son. So that to, what I'm hoping the audience is is drawn into is again not so much this objective state of who I think I figured out what's going on. Obviously, you're going to do that, but ideally, at the same time, you're really thinking about who I what do the parents think is going on right now, and so not to give anything away by the end, but um, I'm more concerned at the end with how the parents process what it is they've discovered versus um, a, a traditional whodunit. Now, in the later episodes, they talk about uh, something they call the murder gene, uh, which is not something that I was familiar with. Maybe I don't spend enough time in this genre. Uh, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a real thing. There, uh, there are lots of... Um, you know, there's lots of efforts made on the parts of uh, defense attorneys in, in terms of trying to get their clients lesser sentences. And there's also efforts made on the part of prosecutors to sort of use it as some form of evidence to prove someone is capable of murder. But there, you know, there are there's evidence that there are genetic links um, that are inherited uh, from parents to children uh, that could suggest uh Again, not not that a flip is not that a switch is going to be flipped and you automatically are going to commit a crime, but that you are, are in possession of the capability more than the average person. There's like a book I I read and I wound up using this gentleman as a as a consultant by a man named James Fallon, who is an expert in psychopathology, and he has this great book called The Psychopath Inside, and uh, he is a, a very interesting guy who was drawn to study psychopathology, he's a, he's a neuroscientist, and in doing so, stumbled on a realization that he himself possesses lots of genetic traits that would suggest psychopathology on his own, on his own behalf. And, um, and he starts to realize that certain things about his personality uh, that he's always felt um, uncertain about do fall into the category of psychopath. And obviously, he's not a psychopath, 
but he's a big proponent of having to sort of check that part of him because he knows that in the same way that you're you have a genetic predisposition to obesity or to addiction um there are things that you inherit that make you more likely to be violent than other people if you have a certain uh, genetic uh, makeup so that's where it comes from how does the uh, main family's socioeconomic status influence the story it's a good question uh because you know i live in a town that's not unlike the town in the i live in a town called chapaqua which is in new york it's uh, probably a little more affluent than the town of Newton, but it's not unlike Newton in that it's filled with a lot of professionals who go to work every day in, in the big city nearby. And in, in the case of Newton, it's it's Boston. Um, I thought what I, what I was interested in, uh, especially in terms of Chris's character, Andy Barber, was that there's something aspirational to that life. Not it, it, What I was not interested at all in doing is sort of poking fun at a certain suburban comfortability or um, or this idea that we're all insulated. It's a part of the story, but to me, what I was more interested in was a person who came from much uh, more modest circumstances and who sort of built up a life for himself that the house he has and the, and the family he's made and um, and the social trappings of that are, are things that he's been working very hard his whole life to attain and in some sense always feels that he's sort of playing a role within it instead of it being his genuine self. And that to me was the more interesting uh, uh, angle into what does it mean to be in these, you know, sort of uh, upper middle class tax bracket world they're in. Again, he's a prosecutor, his wife is a social worker, so they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not living a particularly affluent lifestyle, but they're living, you know, better than a lot of Americans. Um, but again, to me, I was more interested in this notion of building something that seems safe and then how fragile that winds up being. Uh, now, we're talking weeks before the show premieres, and uh, even when this interview goes up, it'll be another month before the finale. But I do want to ask about it. So hopefully you can answer with maybe enough sub subtext that people who are watching this later can read between the lines. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, just broadly, after seven episodes, as far as I can tell, mostly sticking to the novel, uh, why change anything about what happens toward the end of the story? Uh, thematically, I feel like you uh, still achieve the same goals, but I, I found that a lot of these specifics were changed. Um, it's a little hard to answer that without getting into the details and giving away where the changes are. Uh, let me think of, uh, there's a way to put this, though, that, I, as you said, maybe allow you to read between the lines. It does come down to this idea of what is the journey that our our parents are on, and to what extent um, are they constructing their own prison, for lack of a better word, um, through the decisions they made over the course of the story. Um, again, I'm really trying not to spoil anything other than to say, you know, there's, there's an element early on about uh, not being totally truthful with your spouse. And there's a challenge that's going on throughout the story about how truthful they should and they should or shouldn't be with each other to preserve their family unit. And what I was really interested in, which isn't an element in the book necessarily, um, was putting the parents in a position where they had a choice. They could either really be super forthcoming with each other and put everything on the table, even if at risk doing some damage, um, or they could sort of retreat to a place where they holding on to their own private lives for what they could perceive as the well-being of their family. I'm really coding this, so this is almost going to make no sense or whatever. Um, but. Uh, at the end of the day, that was what I was really interested in, uh, is, is this notion of to what extent do we build our lives on, on necessary lies? And is it possible once we've put those lies out there to ever go backwards? Um, and so that's in the book. Uh, the ending in the book is a little more concrete and it doesn't really concern itself that much with 
the way the parents are communicating with each other about what they're going through. It's much more the parents and this child. The other thing I'll say is I think if you look at the novel, Jacob himself has written quite differently in the novel from the very beginning. He's written um, in a way that, uh, so much coding to do here. He's written in a way that the ending in the book makes more sense than it would have if we'd stuck to the ending in our, in, in our limited series with a character who's quite different from the character in the book. Um, so I think if you had just kept the plot points of the book with the revisions that, we've, that I've done to all the characters, um, I, I think you would have felt something was off or that it would have felt abrupt or maybe even a bit implausible. Uh, very different show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you understand what I was saying through all that? Yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> Uh, I was reminded a bit of a series of unfortunate events where uh, that show, you know, was based on books that came out many years ago. And then the same writer, he actually adapted it into the show. So things that were changed in the ending uh, in that show, I kind of interpreted as him, you know, trying something different, maybe uh, thinking about how he would have written it if he were writing it more recently. And I saw that uh, William Land is a consultant on this show. So I'm wondering, did he have any input? in uh you know revising anything it's a great question he didn't uh he didn't want to jump in in terms of like hey let me help you figure this out um but i felt i owed him uh you know the the respect of, of informing him along the way when i was making big substantive changes so in terms of the ending for example once i landed on what i wanted to do he was actually one of the very first people i pitched it to and he was very much in favor of it. He, I think, had his own concerns about how his ending would have translated if you'd, you know, sort of been very faithful to it. Um, so he was quite excited about the possibilities that, you know, came with this revised version of where the family winds up. Um, and actually, along the way, he was an invaluable resource because he used to be uh, an assistant district attorney himself. And so, when I had questions, not only about the law, but about how lawyers behave, I could always just pick up the phone and call him. It's a lovely guy, couldn't have been more supportive. Um, while I was working, I gave him the first maybe three scripts to read. And I think by the third script, the story was changing enough. Certainly the characters were different enough that I think he was starting to feel that he would be better off just letting me be then and just talking through ideas without actually reading the scripts and getting sort of thrown by them. Uh, but yeah, I know he's now watched all eight episodes and was very happy with the, you know, the treatment of his book. So, which is a huge relief for me, obviously. All right. Well, Mark, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, I look forward to our viewers seeing Chris Evans, Michelle Dockery, and everyone else uh, portray your scripts on screen. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it.